Reformation. What do they have to do with it? Did you know they really have a great deal to do with it? We'll see that, I hope, as we go on a little bit further. We can start to answer that question by noticing a pattern. A pattern that is repeated many times in Scripture and illustrated by those very brief passages. I know you thought it was a very long reading this morning, but hey, this is the Word of God, folks. In those brief passages dealing with this little handful of kings. In a nutshell, what are the key differences between the kings about whom we have just read? Answer. On the one side, carnal, pleasure-seeking, willful rebellion against the word of God and refusing to believe. On the other side, faith, sacrifice, and, this is a word we don't like, obedience to the word of God. This is precisely the contrast also between all the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 and the rest of the world that surrounded them. But there's more to it than that. Did you notice a progression? As I read through those passages, starting back there with Solomon. We started our readings with a good king, King Solomon. Solomon was the son of David by Bathsheba, the daughter, the granddaughter of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's wisest counselor. He had it in his genes, Solomon. (laughs) When we're told that when he spoke, when Ahithophel, that is, spoke, it was like speaking to the oracles of God himself. David was no slouch either when it came to wisdom. God used David to write most of the Psalms. And Solomon is declared to be the wisest man in the Old Testament. God used him to write the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. Three whole books of the Bible were written by these two men, as well as other historical books listing many more of their words and deeds. But we also see that there were some problems that later began to affect generations that would yet be future. Both David and Solomon had problems with sex sins. But when he gets to Solomon, the sex sins led him into another kind of compromise, another very dangerous kind of compromise. He married, you heard it, I read those two verses, he married the daughter of Pharaoh who brought her pagan religion to Jerusalem. Solomon was using marriage in a way that God never intended for it to be used. He was using it as a political power play. It says he made affinity with the king of Egypt. In other words, if war was looming, Pharaoh could not attack Solomon because Solomon had Pharaoh's daughter. It was sort of like a nasty little hostage situation. In reading 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and there are many passages which we did not cover that relate to David and Solomon in those, we discover many other compromises of that sort with all of David's wives and all of Solomon's wives and concubines, totaling 1,000 women. You know, that wasn't exactly what God's plan for marriage had been established as. But what David had started by breaking the divine norm for marriage, Solomon took to excess and ended up polluting the worship of God. Now, you probably understand that what I'm driving toward is the perversion of of marriage under the Roman Catholic system where you have priests that cannot marry because it's supposed to be more holy, where you have nuns who cannot marry because it's supposed to be more holy, but what it is is its license to other forms of sins. And during the Reformation, though the priests could not marry, yet most of them had concubines Most of them had illicit relationships just as long as they didn't get married. Most of the monasteries which were close to convents had secret tunnels between the monastery and the convents where the monks regularly visited the nuns and the unborn babies were murdered and buried in the tunnels. You may have read the Philadelphia newspaper this week. Another Roman Catholic priest has been exposed after having years and years and years ago molested little boys. One of the things we'll see 
is that moral sins tend to lead into apostasy. Let me read it to you, 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Hittites were one of the most filthy people of the ancient world. Of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children, it wasn't because he was ignorant of the facts. <coughs> it wasn't because God hadn't given him revelation on this issue. The Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after the God, uh, of their gods. But Solomon clave unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Moral sin can pull you into apostasy. Did you know that? That's what was happening at the time of the Reformation. Folks, that's what's happening in America today. History repeats itself. <coughs> For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Who you marry makes a great deal of difference, because they can turn your heart away from God. Oh, it may be with just little things at first, Maybe with your church attendance or prayer meeting attendance or whether or not you want to get there for the first part of the worship or, you know, dozens of other little things. I meddle. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Can you understand that? Solomon, who had two direct contacts with God, where God spoke to him directly, and where Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him. Sex sins will pull you away from the true doctrine of the Word of God. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Hear it carefully. For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. <clears throat> which, you know, happened in the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon who was an idiot jerk, who didn't learn anything from the wisdom of his father, and decided he wanted to be a tough guy. And so ten tribes left. The ten northern tribes under Jeroboam I and established the kingdom of Israel, and David's descendants had the kingdom of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. What's astonishing about all of this is the fact that God personally appeared to Solomon and asked Solomon what he wanted. And Solomon asked for wisdom. God wasn't stingy with that. God gave Solomon wisdom. In other words, Solomon did not fall into these sins for lack of wisdom. He entered into the sins knowingly and with his eyes wide open. Just like Adam. 
In the passages that we read earlier, we saw how this ended in the divided kingdom, ten northern tribes splitting away from the descendants of David, only Judah and Benjamin remaining with the Davidic line. And as time progressed, we saw that both Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, multiplied the sins that were started by Solomon. Solomon probably thought it was just a little compromise, but it ended with the people of God being thoroughly polluted with paganism and witchcraft. I've only read you a few of the passages, but you should have gotten the idea as we were going through how bad it was and how Elijah had to pronounce curses and the things that happened when you know, Jehoshaphat compromised with Ahab. Let me pause on that note for just a moment. In two days is pagan Halloween. Now, there are a bunch of wishy-washy, compromising churches out there that don't want to get too close to the devil or too close to the Reformation, so they'll be celebrating what they think is a neutral harvest festival. Because they don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to offend those, you, you know, those, uh, those devil worshipers that are come knocking on our doors, and we'll stay around long enough to give them stuff. Uh, but we don't want to offend those right-wing Christian fundamentalists who hate Halloween. So we'll do a wishy-washy in-between. Lukewarm bilge water that Jesus will spew out of his mouth. So let's apply it here to our church. I've heard the narrative from some of the older folks here about the sex sins that were in this church many years ago and then were covered up. I've also heard the stories about how even great leaders in this church held Halloween parties over in the gymnasium and dressed up like ghosts. There was filthy rot injected into the foundation of this assembly of believers at that time. Is it any wonder that this church is dying? This church, as a church, needs to repent for its sins of the past and not just cover them over. We discover this is a principle of the Protestant Reformation, and we'll discover that that was a principle that brought Judah back to the Lord in the days of Josiah. History repeats itself. The Reformation needs to happen all over again, even though we may pride ourselves in being the sons and daughters of the Protestant Reformation. The point of this Reformation Sunday message is that there are patterns in the history of God's people that tend to get repeated because the devil, the adversary of our souls, knows what works. That wretched pattern had happened over the filthy centuries as the Roman Catholic harlot collected her own unfleshed sewage and force-fed it to the people who no longer could read the Bible in their own language. You know, that could happen again. <coughs> there are many countries in the world where you can't get a Bible, and if you have one and are caught, you'll be killed. Advertisement. The Bible in the language of the people is the heart of the Reformation. All the other solas come from that. Sola Scriptura. The Scripture alone is what gives us the doctrines that we believe. So here's the advertisement. We're going to be seeing a film tonight on that incredible truth, and you need to be here. No crummy excuses. So let's go on. Exactly the same thing happened to God's people in the Old Testament. Now we've been setting the book of Exodus during our morning worship services. God started Israel off on a very solid footing when they left Israel. God showed his incredible supernatural power in the plagues. God showed how he could kill their enemies in the crossing of the Red Sea. God showed how he could protect his people and stand between them and the enemy as they were crossing the Red Sea. The Shekinah glory went and stood between the children of Israel who were in front and Pharaoh's hosts who were in total darkness and trying to find their way through the Red Sea but the pillar of God, the Shekinah glory, kept them from reaching the Jews. God showed that he could do it. God gave them the law. It was perfect. 
It wasn't because God had made some mistakes that they got into apostasy. It was a law that was quite capable of being a righteous national standard, not just a personal standard. God showed how he could provide for his people with daily manna and water, and how he could even keep their shoes from wearing out during the wilderness wanderings. We're told that specifically in Scripture. Can you imagine walking for 40 years in the same pair of sandals and never having them wear out, and you're walking across a desert filled with rocks and thorns and sand, and, you know... Their shoes never wore out. Do you think God can take care of his people? But you know, even when they were in the wilderness, and almost immediately after leaving Egypt, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, the people impatiently, are you impatient? The people impatiently decided that they didn't want to wait for God any longer. Don't want to wait for him. And so we have the fiasco of the golden calf. Are you the kind of person that is impatient with God? You don't want to wait to see what God will do, but you plow on ahead with your own agenda. God calls it rebellion. This kind of rebellion didn't happen just once in the 40-year wandering. It happened 10 times. In other words, on average, it happened once every four years. You know, that's a pretty short memory span for people who could see the Shekinah glory, the cloud of glory resting on the tabernacle every day through the wilderness wanderings. People, we have God's word. You can see that every day. You don't have to wait till Sunday to hear me preach it. Are you impatient with God? How much time do you spend every day studying God's Word? The Reformers studied it because they knew their lives depended on it and that it might be taken from them at any time or they might be killed any time because they cherished the Word of God to their hearts. And we treat it like you can take it or leave it. Do you understand what the Reformation was all about? How it changed lives because of the Word of God? How has it changed your life? This is the foundational principle of the Reformation. The Word of God as the final authority is not theoretical. The Word of God changes lives and that. And that's why they killed the reformers and tried to kill all their followers because it was changing lives. That's the Reformation. That's why change took place. That's why entire wars were fought. That's why countries wanted either a Protestant king or a Catholic king. The Word of God changes lives and it makes a difference in the country in which you live if the Word of God is the foundation, and if the foundation be destroyed, what can the people do? Do you understand that the Word of God is being jerked out from under you in America today? Do you understand that we need a Reformation today? Dr. McIntyre, the 20th century Reformation Hour, we're in the 21st century. What would he think as he saw what was happening in the United States today? We needed the Reformation back in the 20th century. We need it in the 21st century. More desperately now, we never needed it before. But do you know God had not left his people without a witness? All the way through the Old Testament period, God did not leave his people without a witness. Periodically, he sent his prophets to bring them back, to call them to repentance and faith, even as he sent the Reformers. But Jeremiah makes a special point of this, which is repeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ references these six statements out of the book of Jeremiah. They're in multiple different chapters. I'll just read them through, but they're in chapter 7, chapter 25, chapter 26, chapter 29, chapter 35, chapter 44. God didn't leave his people without a witness. Even as all through this age of 
day of Pentecost till now, he has not left himself without a witness, no matter how hard the devil has tried to squelch the gospel of Christ. Listen to Jeremiah. Since the days that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. 25.4 And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. Aha! We see God doing his part, but we see God's people hardening their hearts. Chapter 26, 5. To hearken to the words of all my servants, the prophets whom I send unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. 29, 19. Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I send unto them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but you would not hear, saith the Lord. God didn't wait until mid noon or wait late in the afternoon after everybody had, you know, decided it's time to get ready to go to bed and eat dinner rising up early and sending them, rising up early and sending them, rising up early and sending them, consistently, repeatedly, over and over and over and over and over through the history of Israel. Did you know that is true also before the Reformation finally broke through? Did all the way through the days of the early church with the martyrs? Did all the way up till 1517? God is sending his men over and over and over and over and over again. But they would not hearken. I have sent also unto you, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now, every man, from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you, and your fathers, but you have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Rome serves other gods. And they've got their statues scattered all over the buildings that they call their churches. And in other cultures, they have taken statues of pagan idols and dressed them as Mary and paraded them through the streets so the people are still worshiping the same gods, just in different clothes. Chapter 44, verse 4, all, Howbeit I send unto you all my servants the prophets rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. Do you get the point that God's making through prophet Jeremiah? Listen to what Jesus said over in Matthew 23, verses 34 and 37. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you the prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them shall ye kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Verse 37, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often, emphasize often, that's what Jeremiah was emphasizing, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. In the same way, God did not leave his people without a witness as the centuries built up to the breaking point of the Protestant Reformation. He sent Jan Hus of Bohemia, who was burned at the stake for challenging the filthy wickedness of the Roman Catholic harlot. I don't call it a church, but a whore. The very whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. God sent John Wycliffe and his lollard preachers who translated the Bible into the English language. And even though the whore couldn't kill him at that time, they later dug up his bones and burned them and threw them into the river Swift. God sent William Tyndale, who again translated the Bible into English. And so Rome sent spies who found him, captured him, and then with a mockery of a trial, strangled him and burned him at the stake. His dying words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And just a few years later, God did just that. 
These are only a few. Have you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? It's still in print today. By the grace of God, I'm planning to give copies of it to all of my children this year for Christmas. They need to read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and so do you. Did you know there is a 700-page volume dealing with Chinese martyrs? who, because they stood for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, have been murdered by the Chinese Communist government. I have a copy of it. I've only read a little bit of it because I wanted to read about John and Betty Stam. You see, the sister of John Stam was a member of my church up in North Jersey. She's with the Lord now, Glazina Stam. Do you know about your brothers and sisters who are today being murdered in North Korea? Because they believe in Jesus Christ and not in the mighty leader who has taken upon himself the position of God over that people. your brothers and sisters in the Middle East, in the Muslim countries. Dear people, you refuse to listen to these things and see these films because it troubles you and you don't want to feel guilty and you don't want to feel bad about it and you want to sort of shove it under the rug and let somebody else deal with it. November 5th, next Sunday, is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Do you know how to pray? You're going to have an insert in your bulletin on that next week. Would you know how to pray if you were in prison and being tortured every day? And I don't just mean pray, oh God, deliver me from this prison. Do you know how to pray for the people who are torturing you? Be here. You need to start participating. You need to start learning to pray with God's people here. The reason I bring these resources to you is because thousands of hours have been put into them to consolidate and concisely present how to apply God's word. It's better than any sermon I ever preached in my life. You need to be here because you'll be held accountable someday for not being here. I'm blunt today. Because as I have studied through the Protestant Reformation in preparation for this message, and having sat through this last week of incredible blessing, I never get to hear other people preach. I always have to do it. I thought, what have I done? Where is my zeal? Dear people, I love you, but I've got to tell you the truth. Have you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Dear people, I weep for you. Don't you know your heritage? And the fact that now you are called to step to the front line of the battle? Do you shrink from the shoes of your ancestors who fought this bloody war to give you your religious freedom today? Do you not understand what is happening in this land as the sodomites, the transvestites, the sexual orientation gender identity perverts, the child molesters who are twisting the minds of children to want to have sex changes with injected hormones and surgery, and those who want to stop the mouths of preachers like me by prison terms and even death? 
Don't you see the parallel with the passages that we read at first? Do you know that very soon, within a couple of weeks, the Supreme Court of the United States will be hearing the case of Jack Phillips, a baker who refused to make a wedding cake to celebrate the so-called marriage of two homosexuals and was fined and harassed and dragged to court because he stood for Christian principles? U.S. Supreme Court, it's going. By the way, Jack has also refused to bake cakes for Halloween parties as well because he's consistent in his stand on the Word of God. Do you know about the Daniel Stutzman who refused to make a flower arrangement to celebrate a homosexual wedding because she is a Christian? Do you understand how if these people lose their cases, you will not stand upon any Christian principles. You will not have that right in any occupation. And folks, that includes all of you. Where does it begin? Well, it started with that little compromising little sex sins of David and Solomon, which ended up with the pagan wives of Solomon turning his heart from the Lord God and resulted in the murder of his own children to pagan gods in child sacrifice and participation in witchcraft. People, we have that today in the horror of abortion and the insane, filthy, eating stupidity of so-called Christians who celebrate Halloween and use the devil's music in their make-believe churches as they wiggle their half-naked bodies under the strobe lights. Don't you understand that empty-headed so-called Protestant fools are getting together with the Roman whore this year to remember the Reformation as just a minor set of differences? But that if now, now the Protestants can get back in bed with a decadent venereal disease riddled prostitute and have fun again. What? That's insanity. People, I have it here. Haven't you read the cover article by Brad Zell in the most recent issue of Redeeming the Time entitled False Light After 500 Years? If you haven't picked up a copy which has been available now for many weeks on all the church literature tables, I wish overwhelming shame on you. Do you not know that it was the world communion of reformed churches and the Lutheran World Federation, as well as others, that had decided to sign up for a turn in bed with the whore? I know our time's up. Time would fail us to cover all the literal physical wars between harlot Rome and Bible-believing Christians, and how Rome has pursued them with a vengeance to many parts of the world where they tried to escape. Some of the great reformers, such as Ulrich Zwingli, actually died on the battlefield defending the face once delivered to the saints. Hitler himself, a Roman Catholic, signed a concordat with the Pope and ended up killing not only six million Jews, but an equal number of Christians, the most famous of whom is probably the Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, though we certainly would not agree with his neo-Orthodox theology. History repeats itself with shocking regularity. With all this history and with the prophecies of revelation about the great horse still in existence during the great tribulation and still killing believers, perhaps you're tempted to despair. But you know what? There's still great hope for us. God sent repeated prophets throughout the Old Testament to call his people back. God sent repeated courageous men throughout the centuries as Rome declined to call his people back. Did you listen as I read that final passage about King Josiah? The compromises had started with one great king, David. They were multiplied by his son, wise King Solomon. They overwhelmed both Israel and Judah after Rehoboam split the kingdom. But God had not abandoned his people. God raised up Josiah when he was still a young man. One man had started the process of falling into decadence and decay, David himself. It increased with Solomon and the kings in both halves of the kingdom after him. But God used one man to turn the tide, just as he did with Luther. God uses people. But they must have courage. They must be willing to risk their own lives. They may live, but they also may die. But one thing is this, they are committed to standing and saying, as Elijah the prophet did when he stood in front of Ahab, and Ahab said, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? 
They must be willing to stand and say as Elijah did, Thus saith the Lord, with authority, with the backing of Scripture, and with fierce courage. God called Esther to the kingdom for such a time as this. God called tiny little Paul to go through incredible suffering. God called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go through the fire. But Christ was with them. There was a fourth man in the furnace. Those of you who are not here to see that film missed it. It was called The Fourth Man. But you missed it. God called Daniel to the lion's den where the angel of the Lord shut their mouths. God used one man to reverse the tide against overwhelming odds. It's not whether you got many or few, it's do you have the Lord on your side? Do you ever pray that God will use you will use you to stand against the apostasy of the day. I hope so. The Reformation was a return to the Bible which declared that the just shall live by faith. By faith alone. One of the great five souls of the Reformation. And the just are not only made alive by faith, but faith is what controls their daily walk. I had much more here today that I wanted to share with you, but perhaps we'll save that for another time. There are four more pages to this. Reformation or revolution? I'll just go to my closing paragraph. Reformation or revolution? What is it? Which do we choose? Luther and the others tried to reform the Catholic Church, but they had to break from it. They didn't reform it. There were many, many wars which the Catholic Church considered revolution by the Protestants. But which is it for us? I'd like to offer a third option. Repentance and return. You see, what the reformers ended up doing wasn't really reforming Rome, and it wasn't rebellion against Rome. It was a return to the doctrine of the apostles. But there had to come some repentance, too. And people, when we have fallen far away from the Lord by our sins of sloth, and rebellion and foolishness and compromise and trying to be incognito so that nobody knows we're a Christian we need to repent and we need to return gracious father we come before you today as your people and we come by your mercy with a spirit of repentance. Oh, Father, we have sinned. We as a church have sinned. This church has a history of many sins which were never dealt with. And, Father, we lay those before you now. We corporately repent, not merely individually repenting for our own sins, but we corporately repent. Because with repentance comes forgiveness. With repentance comes restoration. With repentance comes new beginnings. Father, as we come before you, we not only repent, but it is our heart's desire to return to the foundation which you have given to us. Sola Scriptura, in all matters, not only of faith, but of practice. For the word of God, when it is believed, 
changes the way that we live. If it does not change the way we live, it has not been believed. And that's what Rome hated about the reformers. It suddenly made them into men who were willing to die for what they believed. It changed the way they lived, and it changed the lives of the people who followed their teachings. Make us men and women and boys and girls who truly believe, who truly believe your word as your word by the Spirit of God changes our lives. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing.